Live from Vienna, Austria, it's theCUBE. Covering .next Europe 2016. Brought to you by Nutanix. Here's your host, Stu Miniman. Welcome back to SiliconANGLE Media's coverage of theCUBE. Happy to be at the inaugural European conference here for Nutanix's .next show here in Vienna, Austria. And welcome me for the last segment uh, of the interviews that we're doing is Chris Caderas, who's the Vice President of EMEA mm -hmm. for Nutanix. Uh, Chris, uh, you've been with the company about three weeks. Three and weeks, uh, you yeah. know, big show here uh, in, in your home turf, so uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, thank you for having me. All right, so Chris, give us a little bit, you know, your background and you know, what brought you over to you know, Nutanix? Sure, yeah, I, I've been in, uh, let's call it the infrastructure technology industry for about 24 years. Yeah. Um, background is I started with a company uh, that no longer exists called Cabletron Systems, so uh, those of you from, you know, from long ago will remember Cabletron. Yeah, yeah, I'm a networking guy by background, and yeah. you know, okay, Cabletron, Day Networks, all those ones, you yeah. know, uh, the, the Route 128 uh, you know, technology uh, cordon, cordon yeah. that had a lot of these companies. Yeah, great company, spent uh, about seven and a half to eight years there, uh, up in uh, New Hampshire at their corporate headquarters, and then went down to New York City and worked for them for a while. Um, then I, uh, I left the company, I went to Smarts, which is the, if you know the IP Yeah, you it was know, acquired space. by EMC. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I actually went to EMC before, they acquired Smarts, uh, so I went to EMC back in 2002. Uh, I was at EMC for about 15 and a half years. Uh, spent about half of that in the U.S. running sales for half of the country for the commercial division, um, and then uh, was moved over to uh, the U.K. Uh, to be effectively the COO for the EMEA business. Uh, well, that was about seven years ago, so I've been here for about seven years. Yeah, Chris, uh, you know, I, I, I commiserate with you. I think any of us that have been in the IT industry mm -hmm. for long enough, you look back on your resume, and I look on LinkedIn, and mm -hmm. the companies are either, you know, gone, have been acquired, yeah. or they're not the name. Uh, you and I both worked at a company that was called EMC, yeah. um, and LinkedIn says I worked for Dell EMC, and I left six years ago, yeah. so uh, <laughs> I, I never worked for Dell EMC. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I actually worked there for two days, yeah. so that, that's okay. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, you know, it was a great, it was a great, great company. It is a great company, and will be a great company in the future. Um, but you know, I've made a different decision to move on uh, in my career, and uh, you know, they're a great partner of ours as well. So I think this company has incredible potential. I think a lot of people see that. Um, I think we're addressing to the heart of the need of what customers need in their infrastructures today. Um, and when I looked in the industry, you know, I started looking a few years ago, just like most people, because the industry had transitioned, right? Technology was transitioning at such pace. So you look up and you say, where do you go, right? To be, uh, to be influential to customers, to help customers do what they need to do. And it's, you know, do you go to a service provider? Do you go to Amazon? Or, or, what are the companies that are relevant today? Um, and at first I didn't even think of Nutanix. Right, uh, I just had, had figured that they were just an appliance company, HCI, that's all that I thought about, until I was lucky enough to have some conversations with their executives and truly understood what they were trying to accomplish, um, and then that opened up a whole new world. So uh, I'm looking forward to you know, the next part of my career at Nutanix. Yeah, so I had an interview uh, with, with D. Roger earlier yeah. in the show uh, and said, as the company matures, obviously globalization is, is one of the key things. Said today, uh, it's only about 35% is non-US of sales. Yeah. Uh, so obviously there, there's plenty of room for growth. How, how do you see, how do, we, how do we measure kind of your success going forward, Chris? Yeah, well I think growth is one number for sure, right? So the more customers that we delight and we please, the better off we're going to be. Um, I think that's our primary, we need to stay on that as a primary focus. So, it just happens to be that those numbers are, are, are counted, right, by how many customers and, and what revenue and what earnings you know, that we have in the industry. But if we focus just on continually to delight customers, uh, to sign up new customers in the business, uh, that's usually what are going to be our, you know, uh, what, we, what we need to look at. Uh, I think, you know, additionally, I will throw the human element to this. Um, we need to create an organization that we're proud of. An organization that um, serves our communities. Um, what I've, what I've learned in many years, uh, and especially the last seven that I've been in EMEA, is that people want to work for a company that they're proud of. And they want to be able to affect change in their communities and with their customers. And if we do a good job of keeping that in line, I think we'll, we'll see success. Yeah, 
as, as you look at kind of, kind of the, your current customer base and the potential customer base and how you go to market, maybe mm -hmm. could, could you break us down a little bit, uh, talking specifically, there's kind of the small, medium uh, sized customers, there's enterprise customers, there's service providers, yeah. uh, you've got the channel that gets involved in various pieces, yeah. you know, how does the go to market work in Europe? Sure, so we're 100% we're channel uh, go to market um, in Europe and, and worldwide as, as a company. Um, the, the interesting thing is we don't have unlimited resources like most companies. Um, even at EMC, we didn't have unlimited resources and you can't address the whole market. Um, it's very difficult to do that and be productive. So we're going to go after the segment of the market uh, as a go-to-market strategy that's going to provide us with, a, with the most productivity. Right? Typically, um, that's uh, with customers on the higher end of the pyramid. Um, uh, we also will have a strategy in our establishing strategies as to how do we go after the SMB space. Um, but you know, we have to leverage that well. We have to make sure that we measure there's a high touch and there's a low touch model. And um, we, will, we will put those structures in place to make sure that we can serve our SMB customers with our express products and that we'll make sure that we have a higher touch model within the upper end of the, the pyramid. Uh, in regards to service providers, we see that as an emerging market for us. Um, the thing is, a lot of these service providers have, have built out their control layer already, right? So they've, for the most part, homegrown it or they use VMware, they've built that out. So Absolutely. it's very difficult to unseat a control layer because they've spent a lot of time customizing it to their billing applications. Um, so we do see a huge opportunity in those service providers that are starting up new, which there still are plenty of, and those service providers that are standing up new use cases in their business. And uh, that we see as a significant market. So we're verticalizing in those markets that are heavy service provider oriented. Um, and we'll provide some vertical sales teams to make sure that we can bring you know, the best possible options for our customers. Yeah, absolutely. I had the opportunity to speak with two, two of your you, you know, EMEA service provider customers. Yeah. One was a heavy VMware shop, but you know, had great use for, for what you were doing. And, yeah. uh, it speaks to the vision as uh, it was talked about in the keynotes as uh, Nutanix is more of a platform uh, which uh, it kind of fits into kind of the enterprise cloud messaging. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think to your point, most people still think of HCI equals box. Right. Uh, and needs to be much beyond a box or just storage mm -hmm. uh, for it to be interesting in the market today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing that, right? We're, we're seeing that customers, you know, and customers need to um, need to evolve as they handle the needs of their business users and clients. Um, they're they have challenges. They're looking for answers, and I think you know some of the messaging that we've talked about in this conference in the last couple of days around uh, that we see Nutanix as the AD, AWS for the enterprise, and I think that kind of nails at home for a lot of customers. They understand the ease of use and the flexibility of an AWS environment, um, but they want some control. They want some control on cost, and they want some control in their environment. Whatever, however they define control. Every customer is going to define it slightly differently depending on what market they're in. So um, that we think is going to resonate well with customers and hopefully provide some solutions for them. Yeah, the th thing I'll poke at at that is, yeah. uh, I was talking to one of your service providers, if you talk about the utilization yeah. of resources in any enterprise, mm -hmm. it is way under yeah. what you would do the public cloud and still way under what any service provider would do. So yeah. that's why I get excited when I talk to these service providers that are like, oh yeah, you know, I'm getting 70 to 80% utilization uh, because yeah. you know, a typical virtualized customer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more than the 15% and right. even the really big guys that are good at this, uh, yeah. they're not getting anywhere near that you know, kind of 70 to 80% you know, utilization. Yeah, and, that, and that's the whole consumption gap issue yeah, that, exactly. that, that the industry has. And you know, we, we, we don't have the answer to everything, but I think we have a considerable piece of the answer to that, where customers can look at you know, maximizing the consumption of what they buy. Um, and you know, one of the things that most customers have been asking for, including service providers, is a pay-as-you-grow model, right? And uh, just the architecture that's been built here facilitates that pay-as-you-grow model. So where everybody in the industry who's building traditional architectures has to come up with some fancy commercial schemes as to how to do that, you know, you know some uh, how you buy and how you meter, um, the underlying architecture is built that way. So that's something that I think will help customers out. So Chris, what about hiring? And I've talked to a number of the customers here, they're yeah. really impressed with the quality of the people here. Right. Uh, the concern of course is they say when you, you go in a region and you have five people, it's easy to get really high quality people. When you need to scale that to 500 people, yeah. uh, it, it's tough to get the same quality. Yeah. Uh, and talk to Deeraj a little bit about the, some of that paradox of growth, but what, what do you see as kind of the growth plan uh, from a personnel standpoint? So it's going to be significant, yeah. right? Uh, we, we are, we're growing, you know, as we speak, I've been on for three weeks and we've hired a lot of people, right? So just getting controls 
tools and monitors around that is, is going to be real strategic to us to make sure we get the right people culturally and the right people who have the skills that we need to serve our customers appropriately. So um, that is my number one objective. Right? There, there's a lot of things that I want to do underneath that, talent piece, um, but if you get the talent piece correct, everything seems to take care of itself, right? If you get the right culture that has the right experience, then you don't have to put a lot of controls in underneath that. So um, we'll be spending a lot of time on that. Um, I think the key is, is that we make sure that the people who talk to our customers um, really understand value and understand what the customer's business is. And if we can find people from the part of the industry that, that does that, then we'll, we'll be okay. Yeah. Chris, I'm curious, what, what's your take on just kind of the, the, the economic situation, uh, you know, especially here in EMEA. Yep. Um, you know, if you go in the US, they kind of think of, you know, it's, it's just the rest of the world. Yep. Uh, you come here to Europe, it's very understand that, you know, mm -hmm. the German economy, uh, there's certain things that they, they want to control and understand the way they do this. Right. The UK, of course, has Brexit, uh, you, you know, talk to the Africans, there, there's, you know, it, it, it's obviously very nuanced and uh, not homogeneous. So how, how do you deal with that uh, yeah. for, from, from a sales standpoint? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, well, what I've seen is that uh, the market is endless for us. Um, it, economic conditions don't particularly you know, uh, ha have uh, an effect because we have, we're such a, in a situation where we're a smaller company and there's a lot of market and a lot of you know, runway to go. So, so I don't see it as a major concern. Um, you know, currencies, you know, devaluation uh, sometimes hurts, right? So, uh, because that, you know, when you're, it hurts not only us and how we realize you know, our revenues and, and, our, and our earnings, um, but it hurts the customer, right? Because customer has to uh, traditionally sometimes pay more for something that they would get cheaper to be based on currency fluctuation. So I think that's a real pain. If you go to places like Russia, you go to places like the Nordics, you go to South Africa, you see these huge fluctuations in currency. So that to us um, definitely affects markets. But uh, right now we're just at the you know we're just at the tip of the iceberg in regards to addressing the marketplace as to you know how many customers could use this technology. Yeah, do, do you have any manufacturing facilities in theater? What's the kind of supply chain look like? Yeah, uh, nothing. Now I've been on for three weeks, yeah. so uh, nothing that I've found yet. Yeah. Right, there could be something here, uh, but not that I've found yet. I mean, obviously for software engineering, yeah. which is predominantly what we do, right, right almost entirely, <laughs> um, we have engineers that are in the EMEA theater. We have plenty of engineers that are, are here, um, and you know, that has become ephemeral, as you know, with most organizations, right? You don't need to have a software engineering facility in any particular place. Is there right. a software development office, or is it just kind of dispersed? There are some offices, yeah, there's some offices in the UK, there's some offices, uh, you know, obviously in India, there's offices, uh, you know, uh, large facilities there that do software development, so there's, there's, uh, there's spread out depending on where we find the need, right? You'll find specific places like Berlin, like St. Petersburg, where you have, you know, specific expertise that can help with the product. All right, Chris, I want to give you the final word. Sure. You know, been in the job for, for three weeks, you got the, you know, the big European show, a lot of customers, so congratulations. Yeah. Thank you know, you. What, what are you hearing from the users? What do you want kind of take away uh, to be from the event? Sure, yeah, you know, the thing that I'm hearing that I think everybody should really uh, you know, double click on is every customer, and this isn't, I know it's hard to take this, but it's not a sales thing. I'm not, it's not making a sales pitch. It's amazing, this is a religion. And in order to reach religious type of status, right, with customers and partners, something has to be going on that's really special. Um, so to me, I feel like you know, it's a whole new world of IT. Uh, as I mentioned, I've spent you know, 24 years in traditional IT architectures. So you know, I would tell uh, your, you know, your, your listeners and uh, your viewers to uh, you know, double click a bit on Nutanix, understand what we're trying to provide, give us a call, um, and I think you'll see uh, that it, it's, it's a whole new way to do IT. Chris, really appreciate you coming to join, speak to our team, look forward to, you know, in a year from now uh, at the European sure. event, uh, we'll have a lot of metrics and uh, things to discuss, and uh, good luck in the keynote. Thank you. All right, we'll be back uh, with my wrap here from the Nutanix.next conference 2016. You're watching theCUBE.